Miracy. I think if we're going to move at all forward, and I do mean forward because we've got some forward movement to do, we have to dare to be uncomfortable. We have to sit with our discomfort and turn it into empathy for others' discomfort. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this is To Lead is Human. For more than three decades, I've run a business called Leading Large. I help C-level executives expand their impact, clarify priorities, energize organizations, and build cultures of accountability and respect. In this podcast, we help you envision how to supercharge your leadership by introducing you to other executives who lead with clear intention. These top business leaders exemplify the principles of Leading Large. They know that as leaders, the positional power they have comes with an equal measure of personal responsibility. These leaders deliver stellar value to their customers, clients, and stakeholders, and they also prioritize building organizations that provide purpose, meaning, and a healthy environment for their employees. We learn from the challenges and successes they've experienced on their human journey. My guest on the show today is Sharon Bosmeck the CEO of Astia and managing partner of the Astia Fund, as well as a founding Astia Angel. Astia is a global organization working to ensure the success of high growth startups founded and led by women and other underrepresented groups. Sharon developed Astia's innovative approach to reducing bias in the investment screening process. It's called the Astia Expert SIF, a trademark term, and contributes to more equitable assessments of entrepreneurs regardless of gender or race. Sharon has grown Astia from a group of 20 local advisors to a network of over 5,000 investors and entrepreneurs across the globe. And in 2021, she led the launch of the company's first venture fund, which recently closed. Sharon is a globally respected thought leader on funding women leaders as integral to innovation and high-performing entrepreneurial companies. She's widely spoken at the United Nations, Stanford, and MIT. She talks about building inclusive ecosystems and has participated in multiple White House entrepreneurship events. Her work within Astia has been featured in publications such as Forbes, TechCrunch, and Silicon Republic. As you listen to my conversation with Sharon, I invite you to take note of two things. First, there's a beautiful moment for you to listen to. It's the aha moment when Sharon's personal passion becomes her professional purpose. Second, I want you to notice how Sharon's very clear sense of her own identity, which she describes as an economist promoting women's leadership in our innovation economy, is at the root of both her priorities and her leadership, even to the point of defining outcome measures that she and her team can count. She gives us a textbook perfect example of how important it is that a leader knows how they define their own identity so they can lead from that core. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Sharon. It is the best thing to start a day with. I will wear that introduction for the next few weeks. Thank you. I am so glad you will. So to get us started, can you just briefly take us through what your leadership roles were before starting at Astia, becoming the CEO, managing partner? My first leadership role was probably somewhere between age four and six. <laughs> Didn't tell. If, if I'm honest, I am 13 months younger than my older sister, and she was nervous about going to kindergarten. So Sharon went to kindergarten with her on the first day. It has been <laughs> my life's journey to partner with those who maybe just need a little bit of companionship on life's journey. And so I would say I've been in this role for a long time, and it's worn many different coats and many different hats, but all of them I wear with great pride. That is lovely. So once you got paid for leading, what was that part like? Because I'm guessing your little sister didn't really pay you at age five. No, but she used to send me $20 every few weeks while I was in college. I got to tell you, that was the best thing an older sister could do. Take notes, people. Tell your kids. <laughs> So my first job was working for a U.S. senator, and I wouldn't exactly call it uh, leadership until it became leadership in crisis. And there was a moment in our political history that is known as the Keating Five. 
and my senator was one of the Keating Five, Senator DeConcini. He was otherwise, I think, a very respectable and admirable senator. Poor judgment through a financial crisis led him down a path that meant that I, who had at the time of the incident only been an intern, I was actually a paid intern and then hired as a staffer, but the incident actually occurred when I was an intern. And by the time I was a staffer, I was being asked questions by different powers that be about what I had observed in the senator's office. And there was a moment that required leadership, and it was a moment when I realized that one of the answers to my questions would actually cause real trouble for the senator. And it was an innocent enough answer, but it was a moment of testing my intestinal fortitude, as my mother would say. And I rose to the occasion to admit that the three people I would patch through to the senator were the uh, chief of staff, his wife, and Charles Keating. And unfortunately, that two-second statement meant the end of my political career with the senator. And I moved on then to a leadership role at American Express. But I do kind of cite that moment as a really pivotal moment in forming me as a leader. I do have a strong sense of intestinal fortitude. And I face things that I fear most very directly, never alone, but very directly. Yes, I've known you a long time and I've known you to be very courageous. And we'll talk about some of that courage. I'm guessing that's the other way to describe intestinal fortitude. But I love that expression too. So, and then after American Express, so what were you doing there and how did it all unfold? Yeah, so I was sent to American Express to work on what at the time was a early AI system, you know, I think today would be just called rules-based machine learning within the credit department. It was a great journey. What I'd say about American Express is for 18 months, they put you through a really intensive leadership schedule because they don't often hire from the outside. They promote from within. And so I got great exposure to different parts of the business. And then at just about the two-year mark, I was promoted and faced that with the courage that I could muster, realizing it was not going to make me happy. I wasn't going to be successful at that promotion because I would not be happy. And so I resigned and went to graduate school. And that was a moment of real fear because I could have had great career opportunity with great people working at a great company, and it wasn't right for me. And so then I returned. I actually quit without a job, without actually being (laughs) accepted to school yet, moved to San Francisco and then started my applications for graduate school where I studied economic development, but very specifically women's role within global economies and what I like to call the levers of policy that can be instrumental in ensuring women's full participation in economies. So how did you get to Astia? Well, interestingly, during my graduate studies, I became very committed to the space of women's participation in economies. And I thought I would end up working in sub-Saharan Africa on a microenterprise somewhere like one of the ones I had studied. But I went to a dinner for Mother Jones Magazine. It was a fundraiser. And I don't recall how I got invited, but it was a phenomenal dinner. I think there were maybe 20 people, maybe even fewer, right, but 12. And I was seated at the dinner between the founder of Astia, Kate Muther, and the founder of the body shop, Anita Roddick. And I don't recall saying much through the entire dinner. I do recall the two of them talking across me about their journey within Silicon Valley, at Kate's at Cisco, Anita Roddick's fundraising for the body shop. And what was similar in both of their journeys was this observation that access to capital, particularly for women, was different than for men. And I must say I was hooked. I had never heard of venture capital prior to that. I had to approach Silicon Valley much as an academic would, with many questions, curiosity, and a keen commitment to learning. And that's how I came to Astia. Was there something specific other than just your general makeup and the wiring that you described that drove this passion for helping women leaders? Well, it's interesting. I've never thought of it as helping women leaders. I think my journey was always about helping economies. I had always kind of approached the uh, studies with this sensitivity that if economies fully leveraged half their talent, what would they see differently? And when I first started learning about venture, what I learned was that there were so few women present that there was this economic lever that could be used, as it were, to really improve the performance of this part of the economy, this part of the economy that was driving innovation. 
that was creating all of the new jobs, that was really contributing to a vibrant and growing economy, not just here in Silicon Valley, but actually across the U.S. It was a real differentiator for us as a country that we had an innovative and innovation-based economy. I started asking the questions, yes, but what if? What if it included more women? What if it included them in roles or positions of power, equity, and influence, not just as junior positions, but real drivers of the innovation? What would be different? Then that's how I approached it, Sharon. Really, it was out of a lens as an economist, knowing that it was a real opportunity. And then I got very excited about the women once I started meeting them. I mean, the, as you know, because you've been around Astia, Sharon, these women are forces of nature and can't help but move us to action. Yeah. And I should have said it's specifically helping women leaders access capital because that's the lever. It's not just about women being good, smart, capable leaders. It's about having the money to build from and having the environmental support and the infrastructure. So how do you think this shapes your leadership? Hmm. So it's a really good question. So I think I'm a real believer that all of our strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. So my greatest strength is my loyalty and commitment to the Astia mission of what you just said, Sharon, and, you know, ensuring access to capital for these companies. That is our fundamental objective and our raison d'etre. My greatest weakness is that colors almost every decision I've made in my journey. We had our LP meeting this morning for the Astia Fund. For folks listening, that's limited partners if you're not familiar with the venture vernacular. Yeah, and we're anchored by a really notable limited partner. MasterCard is our $10 million anchor investor in that fund. And of course, they were on the call as were other limited partners. And going back to my point of it being a weakness, I listen differently to men than women. And I have to check myself on it because our LP base is a beautiful representation of men and women. At MasterCard, as an example, had one man and one woman on the call. And then many of our LPs are husband and wife teams or family offices that have men and women in the executive team or corporations or private wealth platforms that have men and women. So being able to listen to both is a real asset. But I do have a weakness for when women speak. And I'm not just saying that like I'm somehow hiding a compliment about myself within that. There is a weakness there because the power that men receive from society is real. And sometimes it's really good to listen to them because they come from a place of power. And I find that I need to keep myself in check. My colleague Omar Ali is our fund CFO. When he speaks, sometimes I start with a discount of what he's saying. No, but you don't know, you know. And if I listen well, if I can keep myself in check and listen well to Omar, he challenges me to think about the power I have, the agency I have, and how to use it thoughtfully, actively, you know, really accepting my agency. So that is my greatest challenge, is that I do have this propensity to discount a male perspective. I've learned over the years that men will often speak with less experience than women will, so I'm always waiting to hear from the women. That's not necessarily a strength. That's just a reality and one I keep in check. Well, and it's important, I think, what you've acknowledged that I want all the listeners here to think about is we all have worldviews and we all have perspectives and things that matter deeply to us. And they do create the frame through which we see the world. So again, a great example of your courage, I think, in saying, I have to be careful here. And particularly when it comes to learning the lessons of power, we women have had our own sources of power and our own environments where we are very powerful. But historically, they haven't really been in economically producing ventures. So that experience of owning and embracing and like really getting comfortable with that power it does change the way we stand in the world. And I guess it makes me curious, how do you think it's changed the way you stand in the world as you own it and embrace it more? Well, I'm sure it has. And of that, I have no doubt. I think I would be a bit naive to think that I fully understand it, Sharon. I think it's the right question. And it's one I always need to reflect on. What I do to make sure that I'm present and using all of my strengths to the greatest potential is interestingly, I surround myself with a level of inclusion that some might criticize as quota based. If I'm in a room 
I count the number of men and women. If I'm in my boardroom, I count the number of men and women. I count the number of people of color, specifically Black and Latino, who are very poorly represented within the venture community. I do a lot of counting. Maybe that's the economist in me, but it's how I've learned to get to where I want to be. If what I intend is to have a community, you mentioned Astia's 5,000 member community. If I intend that it is inclusive, then when I count, it better be inclusive. That's the only measure, right? And I'm really proud that when we started building out that advisor community with 20, it was half men and half women. Fast forward to today, that 5,000 commuter is nearly 50-50. And I mean, we all, anyone who's ever been to any kind of statistics program or management program knows that if you don't measure it, it doesn't count. If you don't count it, it can't be important. So as you've been speaking these last few minutes, I'm listening for the principles of leadership that you operate by. And so I heard two, I think. One is obviously inclusivity, which is very important, that sense of walking with, not guiding or following, but walking beside. And another one is intentionality. And that's what I often talk about when we're choosing guests. I look for guests with intentionality. So besides those, what other principles do you have about what makes a great leader? I'm very much values driven. So those two that you mentioned, you know, intentionality and the walking with, I do from a very values-based position. And I say my value front and center. I value women as leaders. Now that doesn't mean I don't value others. And that doesn't mean that I don't value other things, but it is the thing that I lead with. I lead through my valuing women as leaders. It sounds so simple, but a mission statement like that for oneself, I find, just helps remove unnecessary activities from the plate because we're all way too busy, if you ask me. We'd all benefit from some naps. (laughs) Personally, I like my naps. But equally, it helps attract other people to you who value the same. So what do you do differently in how you lead your organization from this point of view? Yeah, I lead it unapologetically. So the market really wants us to apologize for bringing in women. And I can give you just a few examples. Right now, there's a real backlash against DEI initiatives, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Corporations all over the place are scrambling to figure out. Governments, corporations, you name it. Right. Well, fine. They should go figure it out. I know what my values are. I value women as leaders, and I am unapologetic about it. So while that kind of discussion is happening in the market, I don't join it. I don't try and solve it for them. I have my clarity. When we were meeting with LPs, fundraising for the fund, a number of LPs who did not invest in the fund asked us the question, aren't we worried that we'll miss out on deals because we're so focused on deals that include women? And my answer was no, not worried at all. There are plenty of deals, plenty of deals to go around. I have no FOMO. uh, And it's, not because I'm arrogant and think I'm finding better deals. It's because I know I can commit to valuing women as leaders and commit to inclusion, commit to higher returns, commit to investing innovation. There is ample opportunity for both. And whomever, you know, XYZ venture firm is who only has men in the portfolio, I bet they never once worry about missing out on deals because there are no women. And I don't blame them. They've got their method. They've got their thesis. They've got their strategy. Go forward and prosper is what I say. But I know that mine has ample deal flow. We looked at 1,300 investments last year, representing nearly, it was $2.4 in opportunity. It's just crazy how much opportunity there is, you know. If anything, I'm short on investment into the potential of companies. I'm not short on opportunity. So I lead unapologetically. Now, this creates unique hurdles within an organization because what I'm describing is not for everyone, right? It's not for the faint of heart. It is being okay with yourself in the face of criticisms and very public criticisms. So one, I guess another thing I'll say is that you are reflecting Something that I have found over the years is difficult in the early stages of growing any organization, and that is clarity of focus, unapologetic focus on here's what we're here to do. And I know many companies in their early stages get lost in the chaos of innovation. So I guess it gives us a chance to remind everyone focus is good. 
So I know that you have a large pool of advisors that you work with and other kinds of partner organizations. So what do you and the leaders at Astia do differently than other organizations to bring about inclusion and empowerment, not just among your small team, but also among your whole community of advisors? Yeah. So unlike most venture funds, we actually have a board of directors. Our board of directors is hugely inclusive. It includes people of color. It includes men. It includes women. It includes geographic diversity, age diversity, investment background diversity, you know, entrepreneurs, investors. So the board is a really important starting place because it's my trusted, intimate pool of advisors. And I start there. Equally, the fund has advisors. So the fund has a conflicts committee that's inclusive of men and women, racial inclusion, as well as gender inclusion. And that committee is responsible for helping us assess conflicts because we have direct investing and the fund investing, and they are phenomenal. And then as you expand that out, we have that 5,000 advisor pool, and they play different roles as advisors. And I know it drives people nuts because it's quotas, but you know we don't form a body to advise us without counting the representation within that advisor pool. And I'm going to guess, but maybe you can tell us for sure, that part of your feeling about quotas is just part of this unapologetic way of making sure that we're measuring what we said we want to change. So you must get a lot of challenge to that out in the popular media. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. The best thing is when I never use the word quota, people nod and say, yes, 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 do that. And then if you dare to summarize it as a quota, then oof, all sorts of, you know, it's why words matter, right? It's a politically charged word. I'm not afraid of politics, as you know. I told you I started my career in it, but I am concerned that we get the words right so people can align and choose. So I am using the word very intentionally with you because I think leaders need to know what I'm saying. So I'm trying to say it very clearly. But if I were speaking to Bloomberg, which I've had the pleasure of doing on occasion, I probably wouldn't say quotas. I'd say counting. And I'd say it's based upon my background as an economist. And I embrace that title because I don't want anyone to mistake me for the entrepreneurs and innovators I'm working with. I am much more a student of their success, a student of the success of women within the market. And that makes me an economist. And an economist can count unapologetically. And so I count. What's so funny to me about this piece of this conversation is every business out there is defining success metrics and they're counting all the time. So What's the difference between a target of success measures and a quota as a target? And actually, though, if you look at the receptivity of counting, I think the pushback we're seeing on DEI initiatives right now is because we published some of the counting. So I do think it actually becomes problematic when it threatens power structures, when it starts to threaten influence structures. So I think it lived a lazy life for a long time. And then in the last five years, we've seen companies open up and put their numbers out there, right? Google put their numbers out there. Salesforce, I think, did some salary reviews, Amazon. And now we're seeing this backlash against DE initiatives. It's not surprising because when you do publish the counting, it does threaten the current modus operandi, it challenges, you know what it challenges, I think, at the most human level is a defense of how I got here, whoever I am, right? Is it that I got here with unfair advantage and I don't want to accept that that's the case? I think it's why Silicon Valley screams meritocracy. You ever watch, I think, some of the most prominent speakers of Silicon Valley, they will talk about the great meritocracies that Silicon Valley is, which is absolute BS. You and I know this. There is no meritocracy out there, and certainly Silicon Valley is not one. That is so true. It helps the self, right? If we believe it's a meritocracy, it's okay that I'm here and you're not. It is, you know, I think it's brave to name even the power structures and how it feels to move among them as not of them. And so I wonder if you could talk at all about how you've managed some of those challenges and how you've grown as a result. So I stopped going to certain conferences a while ago. I don't need to convert everyone into believers of Astia. I need to convert just those who were waiting for 
in seeking a call to action as it relates to inclusive investment. So I giggled when you started answering the question because two weeks ago I went to a dinner in Palo Alto. I'm on the board of, I'm an observer on the board of one of our portfolio companies and the dinner was in Palo Alto. I stopped going to Palo Alto about probably just before the pandemic, so about five years ago, very intentionally. So it was my first time in Palo Alto in a long time and it was at one of the storied venture firms and the dinner the night before was at one of the restaurants that every company goes to, right? So there are these tables full of white men all having dinner together. And I left that night feeling that maybe insecurity is the word. I don't know what the right word is. And I thought to myself, Sharon, don't forget that it's okay to sometimes show up. You don't have to be fully present because fully present can sometimes mean you brings about things you don't intend. You can be partially present. Bring what you need to bring to be successful for the moment, but it's okay to shield. I don't have to get on my soapbox in the middle of that restaurant and say, all you engineers sitting around that table, when's the last woman you hired? <laughs> you know, I didn't need to do that. All I needed to do was go to the dinner, be the new board observer, get to know my fellow board members, allow them to experience me as an investor and fellow board member. That was my cat. Didn't need to show up any bigger than that. Again, a great example of being clear and intentional about what outcome you're working toward. And for those of you that might worry that if you're overly strategic in how you think about this, I think we can both assure you it's the path to success. It's too easy, I think, to get distracted. And you probably know this, I think, Sharon, but I don't think the listeners do. I spent many years consulting with large organizations on uh, large-scale change and how to lead large-scale change. And the thing that I discovered was the most awkward was being that person that was promoting the change. We always describe it as being the pointy end of the pencil, which if you remember the old days of pencil sharpeners, you put it down and it breaks a little almost every time. And I think there's a way in which all leaders are the pointy end of the pencil, but maybe it's a little different in your situation where you have to decide, when am I going to be more fully transparent and when am I going to be, as we like to say when I was teaching at the business school at Stanford, appropriately authentic, but not necessarily revealing everything all the time? These are things that men who have walked in the halls of power for a long time, they learned this as boys. We did not learn this as girls. We learned to tell all our friends everything. Exactly. And that, okay, and then here was the great dichotomy, and that we wanted them to like us. So we were going to tell them everything. And we needed them to like us. What a horrible, horrible set of instructions, right? Exactly. It, it's a total setup for failure. What I learned in business, especially business dominated by men, because let's be clear, I am in an industry that is, I believe, between 2 and 8% of the partners, the decision makers at venture firms are women. Between 2 and 8%, depending on how you measure decision makers. I believe it's closer to 2% based upon my own diving in, but nonetheless, let's say it's as high as 8%. We get it. I'm not in a, any sort of majority. And so I have had to learn how to shield myself from the bombardment that that is. And by the way, men are not in a bombardment, but they are different than women. They're socialized to be different as it relates to money, as it relates to power, as it relates to doing business. And so I need to find ways that I get to show up as Sharon authentically as a woman, as a board member, as an investor, without it always having to be that I'm different or that I'm challenging or that I'm influencing. Sometimes it just needs to be that I'm being, and that will be all of those things. Yes. That was really hard for me to learn. And it's why I look back very fondly when I stopped going to certain conferences, I stopped doing that battle. And I instead embraced what I consider to be the real power move. This is my observation of the men on my boards and the men on my teams. I just show up and I show up the way I want to. I never volunteer to do all the work. It's amazing to me how at boards, women raise their hand and they'll do the work and the men sit there going, thank you for doing the work. I do my best to show up. My work is to be a female investor. And I say that unapologetically. Most women find it offensive. In my industry, most women, I think, have been so burned by the process of business that saying you're a woman is really problematic. So I completely understand and sympathize. But for me, it's important that I be this woman, that I say I'm a woman, that it's part of me. 
but it's not where the battle's going to be. I'm going to battle you as a board member. I'm going to battle you as an investor. I'm going to battle you as an intellect. I'm going to lie with you on those same fronts. I'm going to agree with you on those same parameters. You know, it's just that I also really need to be a woman. Well, no denying that's the fact. So there's a lot of ways we could go with this, but I'm going to go back towards the leadership piece. So one of the things I really like to do is to invite leaders to share as much as they can comfortably about the depth of some of the challenges and how they've grown. So can you think over the last five years, what kinds of major adjustments have you made to your leadership? So I have, oh gosh, I have so many lessons. I'm trying to think of the one I, you said five-year window, right? Oh, whatever. I don't care. Tell us whatever stands out to you. Okay, 10-year window. There's a really cool one that we all remember the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, right? So one day I woke up and I believe it was 60% of our sponsors had pulled out because there were all these corporations, right? We were essentially fundraising for Astia and our business model was donations from corporations and woke up and wasn't sure I was going to be able to make payroll after three weeks, right? Basically had three weeks and called one of my board members, Linda Bernardi. Bless you. If you're out there, Linda, listening to this, this was such a powerful moment. Linda said, I'm going to be at your office in 10 minutes, showed up. I had a big whiteboard and the two of us sat there doing some blocking and tackling. And her rule number one was bring in your team. You got to talk to your team, take them out of the office, sit them somewhere. They all feel safe and they all feel good. Express the reality. Let them know the parameters of what's within your control, what's out of your control. And then the third, what they could do to help. And it was so counterintuitive. I cannot tell you. And it was just counter, you know, for me, it was, I should write a check and I should underwrite Astia and I should get the board to under, you know, there were a whole lot of me solutions and her solution was about the us. Such good stuff. Oh my gosh. To this day, I get goosebumps. Linda Bernardi's advice 101 on real leadership is including others. The individual just does not scale. It was never intended to scale. The individual does not solve all of the most difficult problems. Individual surrounds herself with a team of experts, a team of wise souls, a team of individuals who can contribute to the solution and the opportunity. Oh, such a good lesson. That's great. I mean, that's kind of one of the second really big leadership transition points in a growing company is when you realize as the executive, oh, I don't scale. I need a whole team of people who can scale. And it is counterintuitive to a lot of founders and a lot of entrepreneurs I have found with my client companies, it makes a world of difference. Ideas come from places you don't expect. And so, I mean, that was a very strong lesson in in inclusivity, counterintuitively. So that's the 10-year. What's the five-year lesson? Oh, the five-year lesson is a little more raw, so I got to think about how to frame it. So I love to be challenged. My intellectual energy is often being spent in a mode that some might call confrontational. For me, it feels vibrant and curious, really getting the mind going and really thinking it through. And that means I've got to put my ideas forward and I want to hear your ideas. I think the most painful part of managing in the last five years was that's an exhausting energy for certain types of individuals who I want to be able to work with. I'm signaling to Sharon that we are so the same on this front, which again, if you're a regular listener, you probably know. And certainly if you went to business school with me, you know. Right. Anyone around us probably knows this is our energy, right? So I'm divorced now, but my favorite dynamic with my ex-husband was our conversations were like mini arguments. Our arguments were foreplay. And it was, it was like really enjoyable moments for us, right? We were challenge each other's thinking and had that same dynamic with my family. And sometimes it can be perceived as arguing, but it's never, to me, it's not felt like arguing. When I'm arguing, there's a very different energy. And having said that, to attract the type of talent I want, I need to be aware that there are really great, brilliant people who do not find that energy of mine welcoming, inclusive, and inviting. I would say one of the reasons it was hard for me to share it with you is the word bullying was used with me. Oof, right? Which no leader wants to ever be called a bully, nor do they ever think of their actions as bullying, or they wouldn't do it. I don't believe true leaders would do it intentionally. So I've had to really reflect on it. And 
once again, I measure through action. So, you know, my actions are to actively seek out people that this is contrary to and find ways to collaborate and work together. And maybe I won't be able to immediately hire the ideal person because working for them would be miserable, but I can find ways to partner with them so I can learn it. And I only once have been called, used that bullying word, but it was once more than I ever needed. And so I will commit to finding that path. So that is a lovely thing that you've identified in yourself and very brave again of you to share it. So I want all the leaders listening to recognize that there's only power in recognizing where we're not great because then we have options. So you have been known to embrace and promote the idea of being comfortable with discomfort in leadership especially when it, we've talked about challenging or questioning the status quo. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you may have already shared the main ones. Are there any other moments of standing uncomfortably in a space that you have learned from? I'm really thinking particularly, just let me plant the seed now because you'll probably go there anyway, about the bold step you took with Astia about looking at the own internal subtle biases. That's exactly where I was going, Sharon. So I think in this moment of race conversations, it is important to acknowledge that the difficulty for all of us is that it's uncomfortable, right? It is for anyone, any human form, it is uncomfortable to try and understand someone who doesn't look like our human form. It is just true. This is human nature. And the difficulty is that when you're in the majority human form, I happen to be white, I happen to be female, and that makes me a majority in America, you can take for granted this comfortable position, just being very comfortable. But I think if we're going to move at all forward, and I do mean forward because we've got some forward movement to do, we have to dare to be uncomfortable. We have to sit with our discomfort and turn it into empathy for others' discomfort. Some people are really good at listening. I'm much better at observing. I'm less good at listening. I struggle to listen. I think that I'm often being asked to speak, so listening becomes difficult, but observing. Oh, I love observing. And one of my key observations about race in America is that it is so painfully uncomfortable for all parties involved that we avoid. And I think a much better place is sitting quietly, learning to be okay in that discomfort. And it is through inclusion that you will find discomfort because people are going to show up who had very different life experiences than you. Yes. And it is through this discomfort and the sticking with this discomfort that you will achieve inclusion. So start by counting, bring together people who are a lot different than you, count what they have and don't have that you have. And by have, I mean physical attributes, historical attributes, economic attributes, social attributes, exactly all of that gender attributes. Count and make sure that you're surrounded by people who are very different than you when you count. And then dare to stay there when you're sitting around the table and they say something you disagree with. Stay there. And I don't mean stay there and stay silent. I mean stay there in the conversation, in the journey of being inclusive. No other end goal. Would you like to say anything about what you all learned about your own internal biases mm. and how you handled that? So what listeners cannot see is I'm squirming in my chair. Sharon can see it. And uh, <laughs> I'm getting uncomfortable, but it's a really good story. For those who have not heard it, you can download the Edge white paper on our website. Which we might as well say now is astia.org, O-R-G, A-S-T-I-A dot O-R-G. And the white paper is there. You can also email me and I'll send it to you, Sharon at astia.org. So you may not know Sharon is I spent my youngest years in Ethiopia. So I have this real belief that where others have bias, I have a big wide open heart with no racial bias, especially towards black people, because the mom was my nanny who cared for me daily. And Yingo Se was my best friend. And my life was surrounded by beautiful black Ethiopians. And so I believed this to my core. And when Astia started investment activity, about six years in, we decided to host a dinner for those companies that we did not invest in but who had made it successfully through our expert SIF process that you so kindly referenced in your introduction of me. But suffice it to say, we had a belief, at least through the counting, that the SIF produced a racially neutral set of companies at the end. 
And it did. We had 25% black female CEOs at the top of the funnel and 25% at the bottom of the funnel. And we didn't do anything to tweak that or touch that. It's what happened naturally in the SIFT process. So I hosted this dinner, invited the entrepreneurs, and I showed up at the dinner and I walk in the room and 80% of the CEOs are black. And I was thrilled. I was thrilled, Sharon. I will tell you, I thought, here is the SIFT in motion. I've been in Silicon Valley long enough to know that finding a black CEO is a real intention because most venture-backed companies do not secure funding from VCs if they have a person of color in the CEO suite. So I was really proud for the first five minutes of the dinner. It was not until about minute seven or eight, and I turned to my colleague, Monique Parnell, and I said, Monique, how many CEOs in the portfolio, in the investment portfolio, are Black? And she's emailing team members who are not there. We're trying to get the number. And it was sometime halfway through the dinner that I got the data. We had none in the portfolio. So here we are at a dinner of what we call the anti-portfolio. In venture, it is the portfolio that you wish you had invested in, but you didn't. So you track them to see how they did. 80% at that dinner were black CEOs, none in our portfolio. And at the time, I think our portfolio was about 30 companies. So we had ample opportunity. We were deploying about 4 million a year, ample opportunity to invest in these companies, but did not. It was a personal moment of shame and failure. And I could barely make it through the dinner without confessing to the attendees. And I did to confess to the attendees, because as you heard me say earlier, Sharon, I'm a believer that you have to say it out loud to hope to ever change. And so by the end of the dinner, I was announcing an initiative with the Anastia to look at our specific investment activity to find out what we were doing wrong, because there was no doubt in my mind that we had done something wrong. These entrepreneurs had not. They had the same metrics and fundamental business businesses as those we had invested in, but for the color of the skin of the CEO. Fast forward to today, and that's why I am so proud to be able to, I hope proud isn't too strong of a word, but I feel such pride in it because it was so personal, that our portfolio will always be represented by Black female CEOs, Latina CEOs. And the only way that I will measure change for me as an investor and for our investment activity is if we have them in the portfolio. And what I would say Sharon, the biggest aha was that dinner. Nothing beyond that was as profound an aha as that dinner, knowing what we knew. And for those who read the white paper, you'll see that we took very specific actions and we've learned that questions and words matter. As an investor, number one, never ask who else has invested because the answer may be no one and it may be because she's black. And that is unacceptable. You have to dare to be the investor, the first one to go in. The second investment question that we no longer are allowed to ask is, it's more of a hunch thing. I don't quite trust these numbers. How can I trust these numbers? Words like that hide all sorts of bias. There are ways to check numbers. And if you find yourself wor using words like trust, odds are you've got something else at play, some sort of bias at play, and it doesn't have to do with business assessment. So these are really subtle examples of how we've taken a look how I personally have taken a look at my own portfolio. I wish more of our industry did it. We're really good at saying the industry's bad, look at how bad they are, but not looking at our own processes and our own activities. We took a moment to do better. And I'm really pleased with our work. It's early days. It's at the start. But 10 years from now, I will still be counting and I will still be expecting that we've done right by our learnings. So we're going to move to the wrap-up stage the title of this podcast, as you well know, is To Lead as Human. And I like to ask every guest, what does this evoke in you? What does it mean to you? For me, it's that values statement. I wish more leaders would just be okay with what their values are and bring them to bear. I, I do find that in a capitalist economy, too often we default to the dollar being the value. And certainly that is something but it's more that you put your values on the dollar than that they have value. They just don't have enough intrinsic value for it to be enough for those of us out in the marketplace. And, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of the reasons I buy Starbucks coffee, and I know this will frustrate some people, is that they give benefits to part-time workers. Now, they don't need to. They're selling coffee, right? And I think that a lot of people could argue with other business practices they do. But I've chosen that as a value, that I believe healthcare is a human right, and I really 
I am grateful they articulate that value so they get my business. And for me, that's what being human as a leader is. It's one of the reasons why I even started this podcast is so that people could hear stories, lots of stories, of everyday leaders who are running successful financial organizations that also run places that are great places to work and make a difference in the society of which they are a part. And I guess the last thing I would ask you, you've already shared with us your current learning edge as a leader, so I won't even ask you to go there again. But maybe do you have a piece of advice to share with our listeners so that if they're trying to figure out, am I successful in the ways I think I am, how could they check? Well, my first bit of advice would be be kind to yourself. I find too many leaders are not kind to themselves and whatever that means. I think doing a daily check is my inner dialogue being kind to me because the truth is, for those of us who are leaders, if we're not being kind to ourselves, odds are we're not being kind to others. No matter what we're trying, you know, it's just too hard to mask an inner dialogue that's beating you up. So, you know, that's my rule number one. Right behind that is my intentional leadership. And Sharon, you used the word before I did, but normally I'm right out there talking about intentionality. I do believe that it's not accident that we build all male teams. It's not accident that we build all white male teams. And it's not accident that our networks look and sound just like us. Those are very intentional endeavors. I would like leaders to use the same intentionality in everything they do as a business, right? If it's that you believe your business is going to be vibrant and active in a U.S. economy, your business really should represent the U.S. economy. So look within your organization and find, do you reflect the American journey, story, and population? Once again, I'm an economist, so I count and I look and I just, I think the days of being a certain very narrow type of business are over. We're past that as a society. And those businesses that figure out how to thrive in our multidimensional, multicultural, multigendered, multi-storied society will really thrive. And certainly as I look at the workplace today, the workplace just needs to be different. It needs to look more like this society that we're functioning within in order for us to feel whole and fulfilled and present in the workplace. And that's the challenge of leaders. Leaders today are leading in, I like to say, in one of the most complex moments, right? We've got more complexities than we've ever had before, and we should not run from that. Instead, we should stick in the uncomfortable moment Ensure that our populations around us, our teams around us, reflect the society we're attempting to serve and be thoughtful about how to cultivate that within our own organizations. I'm so personally grateful for our conversation today, Sharon. I love visiting with you anytime we can. So I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for this challenging and insightful and beneficial conversation where we can share with others out in the world who we are and what we think is important in how to lead. So thank you for that. I'm grateful also, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you. So I know that there are listeners who will want to stay up to date on you and find out more about Astia and maybe even want to get involved in the SIFT in some way. So how do people find you and how do they keep track? I make a point of putting up no walls. So my email address is Sharon, S-H-A-R-O-N, at astia.org. Once you email me, you'll get my phone number because my phone number is always in my signature. I just won't put it on this because otherwise I'll get all sorts of spam calls. But I return phone calls. I take phone calls. I take emails. And I put no barriers in place. You don't need an introduction to reach out to me. I do my best to respond in a timely manner. And if I don't, odds are I missed it. So ping me again. Oh, that's good to know. And for Astia, again, we said A-S-T-I-A dot O-R-G. I can hardly thank you enough, but thank you deeply for making time today and for sharing your personal discoveries and your personal challenges as well as your growth with us. And I hope to see you soon in person. I look forward to it. Please stay with us for a few moments and I'll share some takeaways and coaching tips with you so you can uplevel your own leadership starting today.
first of all, I think it's very important to recognize your core identity. And Sharon gave us a great example of this and how to use it to define her unique leadership approach. Her self-definition as an economist frames how she sees the world and she knows it affects how she runs her company. Your identity shapes your leadership too. And if you can be brutally honest with yourself about what's most important in how you define who you are, you will certainly be more capable of leading from that core. Second, I think Sharon really showed us something that people might think of as a dichotomy. That is to fully own one's own power as a human being and to simultaneously embrace inclusivity. Her brave statement, I lead unapologetically, helps her maintain her courage in the face of challenges of all kinds, whether it's facing her own fears or avoiding FOMO, the fear of missing out on other, let's say, popular conferences that she opts not to attend anymore, all the way through to managing the inevitable criticisms, often very public, that flow toward any leader who is leading a challenge to any status quo. And I think it's the confidence that comes from acknowledging and owning your own power or authority, however you think of it, that makes including others, especially others who have a different perspective from you, not only easier, but more important. Because we all know that often overt power invites more deference than challenge. And you and I both know that every leader needs people who are willing to challenge their thinking in order to come up with the best solutions. There are so many more lessons I'm taking from my chat with Sharon, including the sheer bravery she showed in holding herself and Astia so accountable to their mission that they publicly shared the shortfalls they discovered in their own processes, as well as how they're fixing those flaws. As for today's tips, we're going to do three quick ones rather than one deeper one today. The first one is actually from Sharon herself, and it bears repeating. If you say aloud how you want to grow, how you need to grow, you're a lot more likely to make progress, even on pretty tough challenges. You will get more support. You also have public accountability. And all of these things really help us as leaders stick to the hard growing that sometimes we know we need to do. Second tip, given the current backlash against some DEI efforts, how can you encourage greater inclusivity in your own organization? Startups tend to recruit early employees from the people they already know, who are generally demographically very similar to themselves. So if you want to make sure that you're promoting inclusion and inclusivity, start at the beginning with your hiring. No matter the size or stage of your organization today, send the message from the top that we're going to get out there and actively recruit for and seek a broadly diverse team, not because it's politically correct, but because including diverse experiences and opinions in your organization will help you all make sure that you're making better informed decisions with fewer unintended consequences. And be certain when you announce this that you encourage counting. My third tip today, it's something that both Sharon and I talked about, and that's the importance of being kind to yourself. Leading is a tiring job and it can feel both exhausting and isolating. Sometimes having a coach or a colleague helps, but the most important thing is to take responsibility for being kind to yourself. In fact, Let's do this together if you're game. Let's both take this challenge to be kinder to ourselves for the next two weeks. Because like a lot of you who are listening, I tend to be a little too quick to trade off the time that I need to be kind to myself, which I in fact do block on my calendar. I just call it self-care time. When somebody comes to me with a conflicting need. So let's see if we can prioritize being kinder to ourselves for two weeks. If you're joining me in this challenge, shoot me an email at Sharon at LeadingLarge.com. S-H-A-R-O-N at LeadingLarge.com. I'd love to hear how it goes for you. I'm Sharon Richmond, and this has been To Lead is Human. You can find out more about me at LeadingLarge.com. That's L-E-A-D-I-N-G large.com. To Lead is Human is part of the Miracy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Soul Savvy Business and Making It. 
This episode was ably produced by Cynthia Lamb. Melissa Deal assembled the episode. Thanks, Melissa. Danny Eaney is our executive producer, and post-production was provided by Marvin Del Rosario. Thanks, guys. So you don't miss upcoming episodes, please do follow us on Miracy FM's YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast player. If you learned something valuable today, take a minute and leave us a starred review in that podcast player and tell your colleagues about us. The more leaders we can reach with these wonderful stories, the better for everyone. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you the next time on To Lead is Human.